Okay, so Heaven Bible Study, part 69. We're going to continue to look at 2 Chronicles tonight. Now, it's been a few weeks since we've looked at it, so just a quick review from last, last time. We saw that heaven is God's dwelling place, and the temple was his special dwelling place on earth. God rules from heaven on his throne with angels around him. Those who prepare their heart to seek God do right in his eyes. God is sinless, and he will punish sinners. When a person dies, his soul departs from the earth, and his body remains at rest. God is sovereign, and salvation is of the Lord. And also, God will not break his covenant with the house of David. So that section of chapters really had a lot, particularly about heaven. Tonight, we're going to really see more about the aspect of God's promises, his faithfulness, and really just seeing how he's still working amongst uh, amongst imperfect people. And you can remember that this is the post-exile people that are looking, that are reading 2 Corinthians. You know, they're looking for hope, looking for promises. But our heaven definition through this study is heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells eternally. It is a holy place because God is there. It is where God rules from his throne in the heavenly temple with the resurrected Jesus at his right hand. Holy angels and the souls of the redeemed, those that have been forgiven by grace through faith, live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe and earth. Heaven will come down to earth and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So if y'all would turn to me to page four tonight. We're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 22 through 27. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, let's just remember as we read 2 Chronicles, this is the post-exile people. So it's after they're coming back from the Babylonian captivity. You know, the temple has been rebuilt. The walls have been rebuilt. But God's presence is not in the temple in the same way. The Ark of the Covenant is gone. They're really rebuilding a lot of things, and they do not have a king. So they're still waiting on that king from the line of David, the tribe of Judah. So they're looking for hope in the Messiah. And as you read through 2 Chronicles, and we'll see this a lot with these kings tonight, that there are a lot of warnings to the people as they read this. As they look back over their history, and they see the curse of the covenant. So whenever the kings were disobedient, when the people were disobedient, that exactly as God had told them, they were punished. But they also see the promises of God as well that blessings came to those kings and the people as they obeyed God's covenant. And they see that God is faithful. And knowing that God is faithful, as they are rebuilding their lives, they still have this hope that God is going to fulfill the promises that he has promised. And the Messiah definitely is in in view. And as we look back at the Old Testament, as we look back through Second Chronicles, we see how Christ really fulfills all of these promises of God. We also see how Christ is that perfect king that Israel really never had. Now, I gave you a list tonight of all the kings, and it's actually double-sided. You can look on both sides of it. And we only have three kings during the United Kingdom, so that would be the 12 tribes together and then they split so 10 tribes in the north and then two tribes in the south and the 10 tribes in the north how many good kings do they have zero (laughs) zero and then the southern kingdom judah they had several kings as well and some of the kings were co-regents so they may have had crossovers of their ruling time as well but how many good kings did they have in judah Yeah, those were probably some of the the better ones. There's eight of them that are generally considered good. But we're also going to see that even though they were good, they still failed miserably in many ways. And we're going to be looking particularly tonight at the time of Athaliah, the queen, Joash, Amaziah, 
Uzziah, Jotham. So all of those are going to be packed into these chapters, chapter 22 through 27. And I'll try to keep us on track which, which ones are good and which ones are bad. But as we look at this from 2 Chronicles 22 through 27, the first question we're going to look at tonight is who goes to heaven? And this really has a lot to do with talking about God's presence in this passage we're looking at. So we know that God is holy and that people can only approach God on his terms and they need to be purified. And you know, as they look at the temple, they're constantly reminded of that with all of the uh, the laws, the sacrifices, the things the priests and Levites had to do to prepare to well, serve in the temple, that not just anybody could go into the temple, and especially not into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest once a year. So there were a lot of reminders that God is holy in His presence. They couldn't just rush into His presence. So as we think about who goes to heaven, well, it's only the holy. And we know there's a problem, don't we? Because we are not righteous on our own. So we're only justified by grace through faith. And it's something that's playing out throughout the Old Testament as well. When you go back to Genesis, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But as the people are, are getting this special revelation of God, as he reveals himself to the people, it's a progressive revelation as they understand more and more what it is to be holy. And again, as these post-exile people are reading this, they're like, man, our history was kind of bad. <laughs> you know, We don't really have a lot of good things. But do you remember I said in the Second Chronicles, in the First Chronicles as well, they kind of jump over some of the bad, the worst things. They don't focus on Israel. They're focusing on the kings of Judah. And even the bad kings are kind of like, yeah, just let's talk a little bit about them and move on. So they're trying to look at, okay, this is God's, God's faithful. He's got these good kings in here. But this uh, first one we're looking at, we're going to be talking about uh, Joash. So this is Second Chronicles 23, 6 through 7. So this is about Joash and Athaliah. Do y'all remember the, the scenario around this? So Athaliah is the queen, and she ruled. I mean, she shouldn't have been the ruler of Judah. She was evil, and she tried to have all those from the line of David killed, all, all the heirs, and Joash was actually hidden in the temple. So this one, when it looked like there was no way that the, the Messiah was going to be able to come when all the descendants were dead, but Joash was saved. So this is the context. Second Chronicles 23, 6-7. But let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priest and those of the Levites who serve. They may go in, for they are holy, but all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord. So we have the house of the Lord, we have the temple, it's God's presence, the only ones that are allowed to go in, and they've got the, the, the king hidden there, are the priests and the Levites. So the common people are not allowed to go in. And now why? It says only the priests and Levites are holy. But were they holy on their own terms? Or were they holy because they were perfect people? Why were they holy then? That's right. It's always on God's terms, isn't it? He showed them the way to be able to approach, to be able to serve. He appointed them, and he gave them the uh, rituals, the cleansing rituals that they had to perform before they would go in. Sacrifices, washing, changing of clothes, many different things. So they were consecrated. They were set aside. So that's why they're considered holy. In verse 7, it says, And the Levites shall surround the king on all sides. They're protecting Joash. Every man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes into the house, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. I think we could see a few things about looking at the eternal, at heaven at this. So one, God is holy. Two, we are not holy. To be able to approach God, three, we need to be made holy. So the priests and Levites are allowed to be in the temple. Now look what happens to someone who comes into the house who is not holy. What happens to them? They're put to death. So all these things we can really understand that we cannot approach holy God on our own terms, can we? We have to approach him in the way that God has revealed. We have to be holy. 
And if we try to come upon God unprepared, we are going to die. I think we saw that, a clear example of that, when David tried to move the Ark of the Covenant in the way God had not told him to move. And when the man reached up and touched the side, he died. He approached God in a way that God had not told him to approach him. So that's a very serious thing. We have to be holy to be in God's presence. Going a little bit further about who goes to heaven, what's well, not those who forsake the Lord. Now again, jo- Joash is the king that they had protected, so he does come to power. But Joash, even though he's generally considered a good king, he didn't do all good things. He's obviously not the Messiah. He didn't rescue the people. And the post-exile people know this because they're reading this past history now. All right, you know, we're waiting on this king, and this king's not here yet. And this is after the death of Jehoiada, who was one of the priests. And after he died, the people started worshiping idols. And Joash allowed it to take place. So this is the context for this. Second Chronicles 24, 20 through 22. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, He has also forsaken you. Now we've talked about throughout this that the only way we really can know God is by special revelation. And we see here that the Spirit of God, just as the Spirit has moved upon the men that wrote the Bible, the Spirit moved upon these prophets. He moved upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. This is not the same prophet Zechariah that wrote the book of Zechariah. There's actually two Zechariahs in Second Chronicles that's not that particular prophet. So this is one of them. And he is the son of Jehoiada who just passed away, the, the priest. And they're worshiping idols in the land, and God gives them a message. He says, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord? Why are you not obeying what God has told you in this covenant? Because if you don't obey, you're not going to prosper. And he goes and says, if you, because you have forsaken the Lord, he, has, he also has forsaken you. So look at this. The people had great opportunity to know God, to serve God, to rest in God. But they had forsaken him, and they were serving these false idols, and as such, God turned from them. Now, as we think about that in the New Covenant, what's the promise of the Holy Spirit being with us? Is that God will never leave nor forsake his children. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And these people here, they were Jew by heritage, but they weren't really Jew by faith, were they? Not like Abraham. They didn't really believe. And this goes further in verse 21. So this is the message. They had been given the message. They told what to do. And this is how they responded to Zechariah. So they conspired against him. And at the command of the king, remember Joash is considered a good king, but at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. That's just disgraceful in so many ways. One, this is a man speaking God's word to the people. They stone him. The king approves of it. The king who's really supposed to be honoring God with everything. And they do it in the court of the house of the Lord, a place that is meant to be holy. And it says, Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him. So Jehoiada's wife actually is the one that hid Joash in the temple when he was a child. And Jehoiada was a a good priest. And here, Joash is killing his son, Zechariah. He approved the killing of his son. So he didn't remember the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but killed his son. And as he died, this is what Zechariah said, the Lord look on it and repay. Talking about a last word the people are going to be punished for their actions. And again, these post-exiles, as they're reading this, they recognize, man, yeah, this is exactly, (laughs) we were punished. We're coming back from Babylon. Going on to the next one, and this is something we saw last time too, is what happens when we die. 
our bodies rest with our ancestors. So there's a couple references to this. The one I mentioned tonight is 2 Chronicles 26 and 2. So this is Uzziah and Amaziah, the kings. So Uzziah built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king Amaziah rested with his father. So this is just, it's kind of like today, you know, when we say someone died, we usually say they've passed away, kind of soften it in a way. So they've rested with their fathers. But it is a description, too, of what the body's doing. The body's resting, but this gives us no details about what the soul is doing. This gives us no details either about the location of the soul. So Amaziah was considered a good king, so we could assume that he's probably in heaven, but you know, as you read through these kings, sometimes it's, I would say it's hard to really say what their final destination was. One in particular, when you read about Solomon, what do y'all think? <laughs> heaven or hell? We really can't know fully. God knows the heart. But man, these kings... They, they were not the Messiah. They fell short over and over and over again. <clears throat> Another thing about special revelation, so how can we know anything about heaven? So the special revelation is, is always by the Spirit of God. And King Uzziah is in view in this passage, <clears throat> 2 Chronicles 26, 4 through 5. So Uzziah, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. So this is usually the general statement that you're going to find to say good king, bad king. So Uzziah either did right or he did wrong, but he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, yet again, another Zechariah. This is not the Zechariah we talked about a minute ago, and it's not the Zechariah the prophet that wrote the book, another Zechariah. And th Zechariah must have been a prophet name because look, this Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. Now, what does that mean? Understanding in the visions of God. He was in life what the Spirit of God. Right. So, God's Word. He understood God's Word. He was able to tell the people what God's Word was. And perhaps he was even prophesying as well. But he had understanding in the visions of God. And you know, it's always so important that God's word is the central of worship. It was so important for Judah. It's so important for us today. Right now I'm actually taking a church history class and we're right in the Reformation, Reformation period. And you know, the biggest problem during that time was the people did not know God's word. And where did the Reformation come from? God's word by his spirit. And it's amazing as you read the history of it, it's not just happening in one place. It's happening all over the place at the same time. And God is spirit is just moving by his word. And that's why in the Reformation, it became so important to put the, the pulpit in the middle of the church because we are proclaiming God's word. And this is a tradition we still have today as we stand in God's house. The proclamation of his word People need to understand the visions of God. They need to understand God's word and what he has to say to us. And any church, and I say that with quotation marks, any, any group of people that gather together, if they remove God's word from the pulpit, they are no longer a church. They're no longer honoring God. And they're going to move further and further away from God and further and further into the world. It's exactly what Judah did over and over and over again. So Zechariah, he had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he, that is Uzziah the king, sought the Lord, God made him prosper. So again, the pre-exile, I mean, the post-exiles are reading this and they're saying, okay, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. What should I do? Well, that's a pretty easy answer, isn't it? We need to seek the Lord. We need to look at his word, know his word, know his commands, and obey him. So covenant blessings and curses are just a major theme throughout Second Chronicles. Going a little bit further, some other Jewish beliefs we find in these chapters tonight. One is pride leads to destruction. I mean, that's already a proverb, isn't it? Pride leads to destruction. We know that. This is Second Chronicles 26, 16 through 20. 
And I want you to see the connection to the passage we just read. So Uzziah, you remember, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. But now this is Uzziah in this passage. Second Chronicles 26, 16 through 20. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. What does it mean that his heart was lifted up? It's pride. Yeah, he was pride in himself. Man, I'm strong. You know, there's success because of me. How quickly we forget where our blessings come from. How quickly Uzziah did not connect what, where his blessings were coming from. It wasn't from his hand, it was from God. But his heart was lifted up, and this pride was to his destruction. Now as we read this, understand that pride leading to destruction is not always talking about eternal destruction. It's not always talking about hell per se. Can Christians have problems with pride? Can that lead to their own destruction? Absolutely. Absolutely. And King Uzziah, being considered a good king, perhaps this is just the situation for him. He's being humbled. And that's what happens when you're prideful. is to your destruction because God is going to humble you with judgment. He transgressed against the Lord and he entered in the temple of the Lord to burn incense. Whose responsibility was it to burn incense? That's right. Not the king. Now, we don't really know why he did this other than he was prideful. I mean, that was clearly. And you know, when we have a prideful heart, it makes us do stupid things, doesn't it? It makes us reason through things and think, well, this is obviously the best thing to do. Man, everybody's going to love me. I'm going to go in and I'm going to bring uh, incense before the Lord myself. I don't even need the Levites. But you remember, to enter into God's presence must be on His terms. And again, the king was not listening to God. Verse 17 says, So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. They were obviously valiant men if they were going in after the king (laughs) to stop him, right? They go in, verse 18. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who were consecrated to burn incense. So really more than just Levites, but the sons of Aaron, the priest in particular, they were consecrated. You remember earlier we were talking about the Levites and priests serving. They were holy. Why were they holy? Because they've been consecrated. Because God had chosen them for this. So they only, they were supposed to be there to burn incense. So they tell the king, get out of the sanctuary for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. So they're trying to save him from this destruction right there. He's trying to get him out of the temple before he makes a mess of it. Verse 19, though. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, beside the incense altar. And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out, because the Lord had struck him. Well, what a scene. The king goes in there. The king's confronted by the priest. He becomes angry with them, and suddenly he has leprosy on his forehead. And not only do, do the priests thrust him out. I mean, that's a very much an action of, get out of here. It says he also hurried to get out because he realized the error. The Lord has struck him. Now here's just several things in this. We see the mercy of God. He did not strike the king dead. He could have easily struck the king dead, couldn't he? Have you ever thought about how many times he should have struck us dead? God is merciful. So, yes, this led to Uzziah's destruction. He was punished for this. Now he was unclean with leprosy. And this may not be the actual leprosy disease. This, that term in the Old Testament is just skin diseases in general. But this was something from God that, that was put upon him. But here's a great irony too. So we got mercy from God, but here's a great irony. He wouldn't listen to the priest. Now he is a leper. So guess who he has to submit to? The priest. 
How ironic in that. So he's going to be basically separated from everybody for the rest of for the rest of his time and having to deal with this leprosy. And who knows, it may have been something painful and nasty. And So they should have listened. Pride leads to destruction. Not only does pride lead to destruction, evil leads to destruction. I mean, pride fits into that category, but this is just a broad brush. Evil leads to destruction. This is 2 Chronicles 22, 3-4. And this is talking about Ahaz- Ahaziah, so the king, bad king. So Ahaziah also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab. Oh, who who is the house of Ahab? He was the bad king. Yeah, bad, bad king. So he's walking in the ways of the house of Ahab. How did Ahab end? Not too good, right? <laughs> Yet he's doing the same thing. And you know, it's it is just amazing to think how often we can look at, maybe in our own families, the destruction that people bring upon themselves. And it keeps on happening. And it just shows how truly deceitful the heart is, that it keeps on happening. So many times, people keep doing the same foolish things. He was going to do the same foolish things. And we see here that one of his problems was he had counselors around him that were leading him in the wrong direction. So it says... He walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. Who is his mother? Athaliah. So the one that's going to be taking over as the queen for a period of time. So he had, she advised him to do wickedly. What a foolish mother. It goes on, verse 4. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father. So the counselors of Ahab were his counselors as well. So, I mean, he's just getting bad advice all around. And look how he ends. To his destruction. Evil leads to destruction. And you look at the big view of it. I mean, you can look at the little view first in the temporal sense. You do foolish things and you get foolish results, right? You die in your sin, you're punished. Evil leads to destruction. And again, as these post-exiles are reading this, hopefully many of them understood the seriousness. God is going to judge sin. Going a little bit further in a more positive spin, a right heart leads to obedience and blessings. So this is King Jotham in 2 Chronicles 27, 2 and 6. It says, and he did, and this was Jotham, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Now, you remember Uzziah, the one who had leprosy. Now, he had done some good things, but it says, although he did not enter the temple of the Lord. I think Jotham was probably wise in that. It's like, where's daddy at? Oh, yeah, he's isolated because he's a leper because he went in there to the temple when he was told not to. So he didn't do that. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But still the people acted corruptly. And I think this is the, the one thing that just shows that Judah was just set up for failure over and over again. Even when they had good kings, you had a good leader for a period of time, but the people continued to act corruptly. It was a, almost a hopeless situation, wasn't it? And truly, our situation would be hopeless if it wasn't for Christ. If it wasn't for His making us into a new creation. That's why we must be born again, because we're, we would be just like them, acting corruptly. But this was a good king. In verse 6 it says, So Jotham became mighty, because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. In other words, he prepared his heart. He was determining what, you know, what he was doing according to what the Lord wanted him to do. And he became mighty, just like... His father, who became mighty and strong, but his father was lifted up. But Jotham, even though he's a good king, he's still not the Messiah. He didn't rescue the people, and we see that he didn't stop the high places in the land. The people acted corruptly. The high places were still around. And you can imagine that probably be very difficult, difficult for the king to really get the people to do what he wanted them to do. But he left the high places when he shouldn't have. So he still was not this perfect King, he's not the king that lasts forever. He died as well. Going further, 
We see that a person's life and death are in God's sovereign hands. And I gave you several passages, and take some time to read through these on your own. But you just see God's sovereignty, and the people understood that the things that were happening, God's hand was continually upon them. And yet again, as the post-exiles are reading this, they're recognizing God has never really left his people. He has not forsaken his people. God is orchestrating everything that's that's happening here. And this is for Ahaziah. So his going to Joram, so this was going to a situation where he's going to go to battle. He was going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. So Ahaziah was a bad king. And look at that. It was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall. God had purposed this situation that he was going to bring judgment upon this king. God's sovereignty, again, continually moving over the the whole course of history. Continually moving over the whole course of history. So it was God's occasion for Isaiah's downfall. For when he arrived, he went with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. Look at that. Jehu. The son of Nimshi had been anointed by God to do what? Cut off the house of Ahab. You see, yet again, God's sovereign hand. The house of Ahab was not going to rule. God had already purposed how he was going to deal with that wicked king. And again, read those other passages that I provided for you. A lot of interesting examples of God's sovereignty. Now this theme is just uh, continually throughout 2 Chronicles. The temple was the house of God on earth. And you see I gave you a bunch of references. We've already actually read several of these passages tonight. This one is from 2 Chronicles 23 and 14. So we got the queen Athaliah again. Remember she was trying to wipe out all the descendants that would have been from David. And the one was Joash was hidden. But here's what happens to Athaliah. And Jehoiada, the priest, brought out the captains of hundreds who were set over the army and said to them, Take her outside under guard and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, Do not kill her in the house of the Lord. So this hidden king has been brought out and crowned king and everybody's rejoicing. And she says, Treason, treason! And now Jehoiada, the priest, says, Take her out and kill her. But what did he say specifically? Do not kill her in the house of the Lord. Why? Why not? It's a holy place. That's right. And you know, as we think again in the big picture, temple is really sort of a a picture of, of the heavenly temple on earth. It's God's presence there. Will there be murder in heaven? No. Is a cleansing. Again, so don't, don't kill her in the house of the Lord. Take her outside and judge her. So again, God is bringing judgment upon these that are rebelling against him. And we see too through Second Chronicles and throughout Scripture in general, God had given the prophets so people would repent. God does not want the wicked to perish, does he? He's given them the prophets so the people would repent. This is 2 Chronicles 24, 18 through 19. So we're looking at Joash, and this is after the death of Jehoiada. And uh, we read another passage from that just recently. 2 Chronicles 24, 18 through 19. Therefore they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. So, you know, we talked about the house of the Lord really describing the temple often. But it also just in general describes God's rule. You know, we talked about the house of Ahab, his family. Who's in the family of God? Well, they left the family of God. They left the house of the Lord. They left the temple where worship should be centered. And they served wooden images and idols. And what happened? Wrath came upon them because of their trespass. God is serious about sin. He's going to judge them. In verse 19, Yet he sent prophets to them. Not just one, but prophets, plural. He sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. That's his purpose. And you know, that's what God's word is 
It is trying to draw people to himself. He's warning of the wrath to come through his word. So he sent these prophets to bring them back to the Lord that they would repent. And they testified against them. So the prophets told them they were wrong. They didn't play around. And, you know, I've mentioned this many times in sermons too, is that we really live in an age now where people don't want to talk about sin. And, you know, it's like we just gloss over everything and we don't testify against them. When God says something's sin, it's sin. And it's serious. And, you know, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to salvation, is it not? If we're not telling people that they are sinners, if they don't understand that, why would they turn to Christ? The gospel is good news. And the prophets were bringing good news to them. But sadly, look what the people did at the end of this verse. But they would not listen. Can you imagine these post-exiles? As they're reading through Second Chronicles, they're like, Man, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be this way if it had been for my ancestors. Oh, but what about you? Are you going to continue that pattern on? Are you going to learn from the errors of those that came before you. Also, we see that a person's good works must come from a heart of faith. So this is Amaziah, the king, a good king. And it says, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. I just said he was a good king. You remember, these good kings were not perfect. They weren't. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, so he, he did actions in the land that were good, good things. I mean, we could even say that of Cyrus, you know, a pagan king. He did good things in the sight of the Lord by letting the people come back, but he didn't do it with a loyal heart. So what's going to happen about that? If you don't do it with a loyal heart, you're going to have problems, aren't you? Because his motivation was really not completely right. So a person's good works really must come from a a heart of faith to continue to listen. And Amaziah really didn't, he didn't completely comprehend the aspect of faith, obviously, because he understood law, but he didn't understand faith. And we see this in this next passage. A person is punished for his own sin. So this is Amaziah, 2 Chronicles 25, 3 through 4. Now it happened, as soon as the kingdom was established for him, that he executed his servants who had murdered his father, the king. So and this is not an uncommon thing. The kings come in place. Those that had murdered his father, he had them executed. However, verse 4, he did not execute their children, but did as it is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall the children be put to death for their fathers, but a person shall die for his own sin. Now that really is a beautiful passage. I think it was Deuteronomy is where it comes from in particular. But we understand that even if we do have bad parents, bad ancestors, as, you know, again, the post-exiles are reading this, they're not going to be punished for their sins ultimately. Who's punished for your own sin? You. So, you know, we're responsible for ourselves before God. And again, he, he recognizes the law. He's, a, he's obeying the order of the law here, not killing the, the children, only killing those that actually had been involved in the murder of his father. But without that loyal heart, he's going to have problems. And we're going to go a little further and see where some of those problems are. And this, only the one true God can save. So this is Second Chronicles 25, 14 through 16. I'm still looking at King Amaziah. Now what's so... After Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. What is he doing? (laughs) He's worshiping false gods. What is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second commandment, thou shalt make no idols. And here he goes to the Edomites, and he brought back the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before him and burned incense to them. So, was he really a keeper of the law? I mean, the law really just exposes how much we fall short. 
But again, remember, his heart, he did not have a loyal heart before God. And here it is revealed in his actions. He did a lot of good things for the kingdom, but here it is. And that heart, whatever is planted in there, is going to come out. And that's exactly what happened here. Verse 15. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people who could not rescue their own people from your hand? Well, what a good point, right? You know, each of these kingdoms, they would have their own gods, and they thought, well, my God's obviously the most powerful God if I beat this, this person, you know, this group here. So their God's weaker than mine. And on and on and on. And here, the prophet, again, God's warning him. He's, he's calling him to repentance. He comes to him and he says, why have you sought after these gods? What are they going to do for you? They couldn't even save the people that you just destroyed. Yet you're worshiping them? How foolish. You know, you read this in the Old Testament, about idols, like how foolish is the same thing that you cook your food with that you're going to be worshiping? How foolish to worship a false god that couldn't even save his own people. In verse 16, so it was as he talked with him that the king said to him, Have we made you the king's counselor? Cease. Why should you be killed? Then the prophet ceased and said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not heeded my advice. Did the king receive that message from the prophet? He's mad. He's like, You're not my counselor. You shut up. Stop this. You want to be killed? So the prophet ceased, and he leaves with a nice word to him. I know that God is determined to destroy you. You wouldn't listen. So obviously God is determined to destroy you. Not only because you have done this, but because you have not heeded my advice. You did not repent. He didn't have a loyal heart. And again, we see it comes out. And here we are, the, the people, the post-exile, they're looking, where is this king of David, you know, from the, the line of David, the tribe of Judah? Where is the Messiah? Where is this great king who's going to rule forever? All our kings were duds, <laughs> ultimately. They didn't save the people. They failed in so many ways. They, too, need the Savior. So God's work in Second Chronicles 22 through 27, we see that only the holy go to heaven, so we can't approach God as we are. We need to be purified. We need to be consecrated. And as we know through Jesus Christ, we are justified by his blood. Those that forsake God will be forsaken by God. Now what's the opposite of that? Those who trust God, God will receive them. Those who receive God will be received by God. Also, we see at death that bodies rest with their ancestors. But remember, that tells us nothing about the soul in that description. Pride and evil lead to destruction. And that destruction is not just talking about eternal destruction. If you die in your sin, of pride, whatever evil, yes, it is eternal destruction. But Christians, if we are prideful, if we practice evil in any way, this is certainly going to lead to destruction and we need to get off that path. So there's a temporal judgment as well, as many of these kings saw. And God gave the prophets so the people would repent. The people, the kings, all of them. Listen, God wants to save them. And a right heart leads to obedience and blessings. But we see a heart that's not loyal, it's going to be a problem. Good works must come from a heart of faith. And this is where really those that walk in faith will continue to walk in faith, will continue to produce good works because they trust that God is trustworthy and they continue to follow him. So our heart must be given to God. We see that God is sovereign over life and death. A person is punished for their own sins. So we all have an individual responsibility before God and only the one true God can save so that's what I have tonight. Anybody got anything to add or questions? Again, looking at Second Chronicles in the perspective of the people coming back from exile, you know, they're looking for hope. They're also looking not to do the same things again that they have done before. And you know, in, in many ways, Judah 
did some did some things better when they came back from post exile. And eventually we had the Pharisees and the Sadducees that came up in the period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Pharisees really were the very much the conservatives of the day. And they really they trusted God's word as a whole. And the Sadducees were anti supernatural. They were very much more like the world in general. And as we get into the first century, you see that you have your conservative base and you have your liberal base. So you got your Pharisees conservatives and you have your Sadducees that are liberal. Sounds very much like what the church is today, isn't it? It just the same things happen over and over and over again. But you see, the thing that's really scary about that, you got your conservatives and you got your um, liberals, they united together against Christ. And we can see how our own opinions can start to be solidified without God's word. That's what was happening to the Pharisees, who were conservatives. That's what was happening to the Sadducees, who were liberal. And yet they came together against God's only Son. And I think that's just a warning to us as the church, that we need to make sure that our beliefs are always being shaped by God's word, not by our opinions, not by the opinions of the people around us, not by our country, our leaders, by God's word alone. So we have a great responsibility to continue to seek God and adjust our lives to God. And we will talk about the development of the Pharisees and Sadducees once we get done with Second Chronicles, so that will be our period in between the Old Testament and New Testament, which will also show us the, where the idea of purgatory comes from as well in that in-between time which is not biblical, just a spoiler. <laughs> All right, anybody got anything? Well, let's close with prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we do thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given us your word that we may know you. As we look at the law, we see how far we fall short, Lord. We see that we cannot be righteous on our own and that we need to be born again to be saved, that we need to come to you by faith, and by grace through faith we are saved, Lord. But you don't just leave us there, that you make us, Lord, into a new creation. You give us your Holy Spirit. We are sealed. We are given a new heart, Lord, that we can obey you, and you have shaped us to be a person of good works, Lord, as you continue to conform us to the image of your Son. And Father, today as we consider your word, just as these post-exile people were looking back over their own history, Lord, that we would learn, that we would not repeat the same mistakes of those that came before us, Lord, that we would be faithful to your word, directed by your word, Lord, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind and not being conformed to this world, Lord. I thank you that you are faithful. I thank you for the promises that we have in Jesus Christ, and we know that Heaven awaits all those who call upon your Son. Lord, thank you for that great promise and the hope that we have. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.